Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Waste not, want not. It's a well-known parable. It's not biblical, but commonly repeated to encourage the wise or proper use of one's resources. It comes from the late 18th century. It kind of sounds like something Benjamin Franklin might have said, but it's really not attributed to him as far as I know. I don't think it's one of his sayings. Jesus had, uh, had some proverbial sayings, but most of the time he spoke in parables when he was teaching people. He often would... Uh, give them these stories that, like we just heard Pastor Brandon read a few moments ago, the term parable comes from the Greek word that sounds almost just like it, parabole. And what it means is to, to place side by side. In other words, to compare. So these parables, these special stories of comparison are designed to tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. So for example, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Today I want to look at this other parable that we heard a few moments ago that Jesus told about gardening. But first, let's set the scene. Jesus has been speaking in a house in Galilee to a bunch of people, but later in the day, he leaves and he goes down by the lake shore. But so many people gather around him that he decides to get into a boat and sit out on the lake so as to teach the people from there. The water can bounce the sound out and, and spread it out better. It's, it's like a megaphone. So Jesus is sitting in this boat teaching, and he tells a number of parables, one of which was this one Pastor Brandon read from Matthew. And it's familiar to most of us. We've, most of us have heard about this, this story about a sower or a farmer. And as we just heard, the, the farmer sows seeds in his garden. And some of those seeds fall on hard path. And the birds come and immediately snatch them up. And some of the seeds fall on rocky ground. And they do start to grow there. But because the soil is so shallow right on top of that, gra that rock underneath, they wither away quickly under the hot sun. And then some of the seeds, well, they land among thorns, and, and, and they can grow right there. At first, they grow very nicely, but the problem is those thorns grow as well, and they, they choke off the, the plants eventually, and then they die. And finally, other seeds fall on good soil, and they bring forth grain. But, but not just a little bit of grain, a really, really, really good harvest. In fact, a fantastic harvest. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold even in some cases. I read that a 10-fold harvest in that day and time would have been truly abundant. A 30-fold harvest would have fed the village for a year. But a 100-fold harvest would have meant that the farmer would retire to a villa down by the Sea of Galilee. So this was an amazing harvest. So, so what does all of this mean? What does this story mean? tell us. Now, we don't usually have an explanation of a parable built into the scriptures, but indeed this time we do. And, and Pastor Brandon read from verses 18 through 23, and it's an allegorical interpretation that's given to the parable. Now, a lot of Bob, biblical scholars in this day and time have kind of analyzed that and they've studied it, and they are of the opinion that maybe this was actually the early church, the church that Matthew was writing to that actually put that together and rather than Jesus perhaps but we don't know but either way it's right there in the scriptures and so we're told that the seeds sown on the path represent those who don't ever get it they just don't get it and so the devil snatches up this message that comes to them this good seed before they even before it ever plants in their hearts 
And then the allegorical interpretation is that the seeds that fall on rocky ground are persons who, who do receive the word of God into their hearts, but it never goes deep enough. And so because their faith is so shallow and lacks a good root system, the slightest trouble or persecution that might come their way causes them to fall away from the faith. The third category, the seeds that fall among the thorns, would be persons who, unfortunately, um, they, they allow the cares of this world, I mean, get in their way. They, they really have taken in the word, but, but the cares of the world, and oftentimes that's wealth, but it can be anything, will get in the way and block their relationship with God. And then there's the good soil the fourth and final category. And these are persons who are faithful and they remain faithful and because of that they bring a, a bountiful harvest to the kingdom of heaven. Barbara Brown Taylor, a uh, well-known Christian writer and one I believe I referenced last Sunday, describes how she reacted to this portrayal of the parable when she was watching the stage production of Godspell. You may remember that from way back, uh, based on the Gospel of Matthew. She says, I, I started worrying about what kind of ground I was on with God. I started worrying about how many birds were in my field, how many rocks, how many thorns. I started worrying about how I could clean them all up, how I could turn myself into a well-tilled, well-weeded, well-fertilized field for the sowing of God's word. I started worrying about how the odds were three to one against me. Those are the odds in the parable after all and I began thinking about how I could beat the odds or at least improve on them by cleaning up my act. You notice all the worry that she experienced there? How many of us react in the same way when we hear this parable read? How many of you moments ago were thinking in those terms, wondering or worrying about in what kind of soil are we planted? It's a fair question and it's one worth pondering, especially in light of the explanation of the parable offered in verses 18 through 23 of the scripture. So we might ask ourselves, what kind of soil supports our faith? Are we planted deeply? Or is our relationship with God only shallow and casual, such that we won't hold up in the life, in the face of life's challenges, or are we prone to give up on God because of it? Or have we tried to nurture a, a meaningful relationship with, with the Lord? We've tried really hard to do that, only to find ourselves distracted by the many enticements of the busy, activity-filled world in which we live, because there's stuff coming at us all the time that draws our attention away from God? Are those thorns choking off our commitment to Christ? There are so many ways in which we may have failed to live up to our potential in the eyes of God. We might fail in our Christian discipleship because we're not in a place spiritually that nurtures growth. So we hear this parable with a certain amount of dread, wondering in what kind of soil we're planted. Now this is certainly a, a reasonable approach to the parable, at least based on the allegorical explanation of it. But is that the only or the best way to view this parable? What might be the takeaway if instead we focused on the first nine verses of Matthew 13, on the parable itself as actually told by Jesus. I mean, that, that was the parable when he, when he told it. The other was an explanation. But as he told the parable, what is the parable saying? What is Jesus literally saying in the parable? As I said earlier, most parables have a central meaning, and, and the parable usually carries a key message about God and the kingdom of heaven. And so the question is, what does this say about God's kingdom. One clue might be in how we customarily refer to this parable. In fact, as the text itself refers to it in the, in the explanation that follows, we don't call it the parable of the various kinds of soil, do we? No. It's known commonly and in the scripture itself as the parable of the sower. 
the parable of the sower. So let's take a closer look at the sower or the farmer in the story. Now, since modern farming techniques are so different from what's depicted in the parable, maybe we should think of this as a story of a gardener, because that, that includes many of us. For those of you who garden vegetables, you probably buy plants to put into the ground. But have you ever planted seeds, you know, in the, it goes from those little packets? I, I did years ago. And uh, how, how do you plant those seeds when, when you do it? Well, I'm willing to guess that you probably thoroughly prepare the soil by tilling it, clearing it of weeds and rocks, and, and then maybe fertilizing it. Am I right? And, and then when it's time to plant, you carefully place those seeds into mounds of dirt or rows that you formed. I mean, you want to know where you, what you planted and where, right? So you're very careful about putting those seeds down in those rows and those mounds of dirt. Am I right again? You want to be careful about what you're doing so as not to waste the seeds. And you plant the seeds only in good soil. Waste not, want not, right? Okay, so now let's examine the planting method of the sower in the parable told by Jesus. What does he do? Does he carefully place the seeds only in good soil? No, he just slings that seed all over the place. Oh my goodness, you know, he tosses some onto the path, trampled on all the time. He knows nothing's going to grow there. And then he tosses some of it over onto the rocky soil. And there again, there's little likelihood that it's going to grow much of anything there or that it'll thrive. And he apparently doesn't weed out the thorn bushes from his garden because he throws some seed over in that direction as well. And he's got to know that those thorn bushes are going to grow up and choke off whatever grows from the seeds that he's throwing in that area. In fact, it appears that three-fourths of the seeds he spreads in his garden won't likely amount to much of anything. And yet, he keeps on just slinging those seeds everywhere. I mean, try to picture that. Try to picture this farm out there just almost just haphazardly, just tossing seed everywhere. It's quite an amazing sight. The amazing thing, though, <laughs> is that the few seeds, the, the one-fourth that do make their way into good soil produce an amazing crop, a harvest like nothing ever seen on earth, something that could only have come from heaven. Let anyone with ears listen, Jesus says. So, what is the parable telling us that the kingdom of heaven is like? What comparison is being made by this parabole? There's a story about a grandmother and her five-year-old grandson, they were walking out in the country just after the first heavy frost of the season in the fall, and the fall foliage had started, and, and, and it had given this brilliant colored appearance of the leaves. Just think the grandmother marveled, gazing at the scarlet, gold-tinted hillside. God painted all that. Yes, the grandson agreed, and he even did it with his left hand. What do you mean he did it with his left hand? She asked, somewhat puzzled by the remark. Well, the boy replied, at Sunday school they told us that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. If this is a parable more concerned with the sower than with the kinds of soil onto which the seeds are thrown, if, if the point of the story is not so much about our shortcomings, but instead is focused on the one who casts the seed, then we can reasonably conclude that the sower is God in Christ Jesus. His hand is in no way impeded, for he's spreading the seed of the kingdom everywhere with extravagance. And from our limited earthly perspectives, we might even say that God is spreading the seed wastefully. But that's because we don't have a heavenly view of such matters. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord in Isaiah. The grandmother in the story recognized how beautifully God had painted the, the leaves. Talk about extravagance. It's amazing how beautiful the fall leaves are. It's like God has got a paintbrush. As Bishop Will Willimon observes, God's creation seems to be filled with such extravagance or waste. Willimon asks, why didn't God just create one species of flower? That ought to be miracle enough, but God didn't stop there. Flowers of all different colors and sizes and shapes 
Few of the world's flowers are seen by many people. Why did God continue and waste so much beauty, Willem and Wonders? There does seem to be a sort of extravagance built right into the grain of the universe, he concludes. Now, God is extravagant, but not just with creation. God is extravagant with the grace given to us through Jesus. And I believe God expects the same from us as we serve the Lord and share with others the love of Christ. I mean, we throw the seed out there and some of it takes and grows and, and produces an abundant harvest for the kingdom. But an awful lot of it, an awful lot of it, most of it, according to this parable, won't catch on, at least not this time around. But you and I don't need to worry about that because God doesn't. God doesn't worry about it. We're just supposed to keep on casting out the seed as much and as widespread as we possibly can. Because sometimes, sometimes when we least expect it, in ways we could not have anticipated, in places we never thought of as good soil, the seed we spread in Jesus' name will take root and produce a harvest only God in heaven could have imagined. I'm going to talk about a sensitive topic now. And I ask you to listen carefully and all the way to the end of what I'm about to say. And I want to preface it by acknowledging the legitimate complaints that many have about unjust treatment by some police and others along racial lines, even here in 2020. Even after years of positive strides that this nation has made in the areas of civil rights, in the area of civil rights. We have come a long way, but we have miles to go before we rest in the confidence that all people are treated equally in this nation. Having said that, I want to lift up a concern I know many of you have because you've told me so. And I understand why. In the midst of all of the protests against alleged police brutality, particularly toward young black men, there's a lot that is not being said. One thing that is not being said is that far too many of our young black men who make up a relatively small percentage of the population come into contact with the police because they're engaged in violent crimes, often involving gun violence perpetrated against each other. You need only watch the local evening news on TV to know this is true. I read an article in the Charlotte Observer this past week that in 2019, there were 107 homicides in Charlotte, and that nearly 80% of the murder victims were black. This is shocking. This is a tragedy. But what this reporter failed to mention is that by far most of the perpetrators of those murders of black persons were also black. There's a real problem here. And it's not so simple as to say it's all because of police brutality or racism for that matter, although we must certainly acknowledge the pernicious effects of racism over centuries that have helped foster the impoverished and challenged conditions that too many persons of color find themselves in today, especially in urban areas such as Charlotte. There are many, many factors contributing to this dreadful situation, and all sides, all sides must share in the responsibility for what's going on in the streets. Yes, there is racism, and it's got to be dealt with. But there's also the need for personal responsibility for poor choices made when it comes to the use of guns and other acts of violence. As I've said before, it is complicated. But if we're honest with ourselves, those of us who are not living on the streets, if we're honest with ourselves, there's the temptation. And the temptation is not to care as much about young black men on the streets as much as we care about other people because they're contributing to their own demise. If they don't seem to care, then why should we, we might think. But here's the thing. Black lives do matter to God. All black lives matter to God, including those holding handguns and using them against each other. All lives matter to God. And I believe today's parable told by Jesus makes it clear that they should matter to us as well. 
The sower threw that seed all over the place, including on the hard path where nothing was growing, including on the shallow soil on top of the rock where it had little chance to grow. And nevertheless, the sower representing God, I believe, threw the seed where we might say it was nothing but a waste. But God sees deeper into the soil than we do, and God can see potential buried there that we might not be able to spot. (laughs) Besides, God knows that God's grace is unlimited. Waste not, want not does not apply to God's economy. In the back of the parsonage where I live, there's a nice patio of poured concrete bricks, meaning they're not real bricks, but rather a pattern of concrete. It's quite lovely, though. And you'd think that nothing could ever grow on that patio for obvious reasons. But the other day, I noticed there were quite a number of weeds that had popped up in the grooves between the faux bricks. I mean, that environment is less hospitable than the path or the rocky path or rocky soil, rather, that was described by Jesus in the parable. And yet weeds are popping up out of it. So you never know what might be able to grow, even in environments that seem ill-suited to growth. It may appear to be a fool's errand when we invest in others who seem to have little hope, but we're overlooking when we do that. We're overlooking the awesome power of God's grace. God is calling us to be generous, even extravagant when it comes to spreading the love of Christ, because that's how God is with his grace toward us. And such Christ-like love for others should emanate right from here. And that's not always easy, is it? It's not always easy. But you know, (laughs) Jesus never said that following him was going to be easy. In fact, he made it very clear that it can be awfully hard sometimes. We face a lot of quote-unquote failures when it comes to ministries and efforts we make on behalf of the kingdom. They can be discouraging and they can cause us to doubt why we're doing what we're doing. But this parable is a reminder that we should never give up. That we should never stop casting those seeds. Thomas Long writes, The message to the church from this parable is that the gift of a great harvest awaits them. That when the kingdom of heaven comes in power, the witness and discipleship of the people of God, always fragile and at peril in the world, will be magnified by the generosity of God into a fruitful, extravagant, and altogether gracious yield. Therefore, the church is called to waste itself, to throw grace around like there is no tomorrow, precisely because there is a tomorrow and it belongs to God. Will Willimon talked about the apparent quote-unquote waste in the kingdom of God, but he puts it in proper perspective with this question. What a waste? That Jesus came to us reaching out to us in love. He told us the truth about ourselves and our world and the truth about God, and we responded by rejecting him abandoning him, nailing him to a bloody cross where his life's blood drained out of him. And even there, even there, he kept reaching out to us, embracing us, forgiving us. And then when God raised him from the dead, he came back to us, back to the very people with whom he had failed so miserably. He came back to the very ones who betrayed him and promised them, I will never leave you no matter what. What a waste. God is wasteful or extravagant, I'd prefer to say, with his grace. And that's why we call it amazing God slings out grace to the world with reckless abandon, not not holding it back just because those who receive it are unprepared or don't fully appreciate it. You see, the truth is that each and every one of us fails to appreciate fully the grace God has given us. None of us is completely good soil, totally prepared to receive the seeds of God's grace. And yet, 
God doesn't dole out those seeds of grace carefully so as to avoid wasting it. Instead, God showers grace upon all of us extravagantly every second of every day, not because of who we are or who we aren't, but because of who God is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. you to keep an image in your mind. I want to put this all together this way. Picture yourself as, as maybe these different kinds of soil that we've talked about. And some days, oh goodness gracious, it feels so wonderful. Our hearts feel so in tune to God and, and it's beautiful. And we feel that connection. But there are other days when we're on the other extreme, isn't it true? When we're the rocky path. The hard path or the rocky soil or, or maybe the in-between, we're trying, and yet all the stuff in life is getting in the way and we can't feel that connection the way we want to. I want you to keep this image in mind though that God, the sower, is out there throwing seeds of grace everywhere and not just on you when you're in those good moments, but God is sowing seeds of grace into your heart even when you're that rocky, soil or even when you're that hard path and everything just seems to bounce off those seeds of grace keep coming your way <laughs> because God loves you and God loves every single one of us there's not a one that God doesn't reach out to and we're called to be that vessel that brings the love of Christ to every person praise be to God that God loves us in spite of our sin in spite of our fallings in spite of our failures God loves each and every one of us because God is love. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God.